today I'm going to go over the Beatitudes, which is found in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, and it starts at the third um, verse. The Beatitudes can be understood in four different ways. One, they can they are codes of ethics for disciples, um, standard conduct for believers, right? Um, I explain once God saves us, right? We're saved and he puts this new heart in us. We can't live like we used to live, right? Two, they contrast kingdom values, right? What is eternal and with the world values and standards which is temporary right they contrast superficial faith with the real faith Christ demands because again you know faith is not stuff faith is not a car right faith is not you know um, the house Christ standards it's a relationship and four they show Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled in the New Kingdom. And so we, we know that in the Old Testament, um, a lot of what we see was just a reflection of things to come. And so the, the sacrificial system and, um, you know, we see how um, the temple was set up and, and all those things are just, a shadow of what to expect now the New Testament the new kingdom they are not choices the Beatitudes I can't pick and choose which ones I want to follow and because I like this one and I don't like that one it is what it is right we have to follow them all if I'm saved right and now I am a, a, a believer right the the beatitudes i can't pick and choose because they're designed to make me christ-like right with the hope the the help of the holy spirit and so each beatitude starts out with the word blessed now i've mentioned in the past that people have twisted what blessed is and so now is if you have a whole lot of stuff, you're blessed. And if you have nothing, right, you're not blessed. But each beatitude starts off with blessed. Now, the biblical def definition of blessed, to be or declared happy or fortunate, right? Webster Dictionary defines blessed as made holy and consecrated. So... In neither definition do we see stuff, right? doesn't say anything about money, houses, car. No. So, they don't promise me, right? Laughter, pleasure, and, you know, all the earthly things that, you know, earthly prosperity. It doesn't, says, it doesn't say that. Jesus takes... The world's idea of happiness and he flips it, right? Being blessed by God means the experience of hope and joy independent of outward circumstances. So that just basically means I have no money in the bank, right? Um not doing well in my circumstances, right? I don't have the job, right? But because my hope, right? The Bible says, the joy of the Lord shall be my strength. My, my, my happiness or my, my joy is not predicated on my circumstance, right? So no matter what, right? I can remember when I first came to Center of Hope International. And I, I think maybe after a few months of being there, um, one of the ministry hosts, 
she sat next to me. Um, it wasn't her day to be on the floor. And so we sat together. And so during the service, um, she had leaned over and asked me, she said, would you like, you know, to be a ministry host? And so that morning, I, I literally was like, okay, Lord, you know, I know that I can serve, you know, but I want you to show me where to start. And so when she asked me that, I, I said, okay, sure, fine. I trained, right? She said the next time I take the floor, once she got the okay from the um, head of the ushers, and I trained with her. And so when it was my turn to take the floor, um, I, I had a skirt already, a black skirt. A, um, I brought a white shirt. I think I brought a little sweater. I had stockings and I had sneakers. Now this is during the time I had lost everything. So I had nothing. Everything that I owned fitted, it was in a, a huge um, suitcase. And that was it. And so at the, at the end of the service, you know, she came over to me and she said, well, you know, sis, um, you, to me, you did great. She said, but however, um, the president said that, you know, you really shouldn't have the sneakers on. And so I said to her, I said, well, um, I want to be in order. I said, but understand this, you know, um, right now I don't have it to buy, you know, the appropriate shoes. I said, now, granted, when you asked me, right, to, um, that I want to usher, I could have given an excuse. I said, but I didn't. So this is all I have. So I gave God my best, although, you know, she didn't agree with me having shoes on the floor. I said, I want you to know that I have nothing. And so when I do get some money, I will get the right um, footwear because I want to be in order. And at that very moment, the sister started crying. And I said to her, why, wait, you know, why are you crying? She said, no, sis, I observe you in praise and worship. And she said, it breaks my heart for you to stand here and tell me that you have nothing when I watch you praise God. You see, it, my praise, right? I praise and worship God because of who he is. And so I had nothing. But she said, you, you praise God like you have everything. But true worship is not praising God for the house. Because whether God bless me with a house or not, he is still God. Right? It doesn't mean that he's not God. And so it's not about stuff. You know, and so we have to understand that when we, when we say we're blessed, we acknowledge Right? That no matter what is happening in my life. And granted, I have some moments where I don't, like, I may be facing something that really may be troubling me. You know, some things are a little harder to deal with and to cope with. But when I come into the house, from the time I wake up, not even when I get to church on Sunday, I praise God. Praise is what I do. Because it's not predicated on my circumstances circumstances change you can have it one day and the next day is gone you know and so we have to understand that this is about um god i relate a relationship with god no matter what situation i'm in i'm going to praise god and so jesus takes the standards of the world and he reverses it and so now we're going to go through the, the Beatitudes individually. And so Matthew, the fifth chapter, the third verse, and I'll, I'll read from the Amplified Version. Blessed, happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of their outward conditions. Who? I have to say that again. Blessed, happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of their outward condition. That's a whole lot right there. I didn't even get all the way into that verse. But that's a whole lot right there. Didn't say nothing about a house. Didn't say nothing about a car. Didn't say nothing about a fat bank account. Scripture goes on to say, are the poor in spirit, the humble and who rate themselves insignificant for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This particular scripture deals with the poor in spirit. 
let's use Isaiah as an example, right? Isaiah, in I think it's the, it's the sixth chapter, that fifth verse. When you start reading the sixth, sixth chapter, Isaiah has a revelation from God. He actually gets a glimpse into the throne room, right, of heaven. And if you read it, he explains what it is he's seeing. He says he sees the throne, he sees the angels, and they're, you know, crying, holy, holy, holy. And so he's in awe at this revelation, right? of the throne room of heaven the very first thing that Isaiah realized right he's in the presence of God he realized how unclean he is whenever I, I, I come into contact with God right we should have the same experience because Isaiah says woe unto me I am a man of unclean lips. He was acknowledging how sinful he was in the presence of a holy God. And so without any hope of measuring up to God's standard, right? Isaiah here is, is receiving the call on his life. And so the scripture talks about the angel taking coal and placing it, you know, it's 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 uh, symbolic of cleansing him, right? Because before God, here again, people get saved, and the first thing they want to do is start working in the ministry. There is a process that has to take place. God has to remove some things out of my life before I can actually fulfill whatever assignment He has on my life. It's almost like if we look at it this way: if a person has a court case and he's going before the judge I guarantee you he's going to make sure he's well groomed he's going to make sure he's in his best suit right he's going to make sure his attire is on point because you're not just going to show up to court looking in the old kind of way you acknowledge that judge who's in authority and so therefore you don't want to look in the old kind of way so you're on your best you, you, you present your breast you want to make a good impression and so it bothers me when people come into the church and then they start dealing with stuff and now you got a whole ministry. But here Isaiah shows us, right? He shows us, if you read that sixth chapter, he, he realizes his, 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 his unclean, he's unclean, he's sinful before God. And the, and, and the scripture says that the angel placed hot coal on his mouth. A sign of cleansing. So Isaiah had to be cleansed. The painful um, cleansing process was necessary before Isaiah could fulfill the call God had on his life. We too must be cleansed before God can use us. Don't, get, don't be in a hurry to do things. Because everything that I do, I want God to get the glory out of it. Right. So God, uh, he will anoint us because he has an assignment on our life. But we must take our time. The, the Bible even talks about Jesus. Now, we knew Jesus was the son of the living God. Right. And so even though he came with the assignment to die for the sins of the world, the Bible talks about how he grew. Right. He grew as a child. He he did the same thing that every other child. He didn't just. Um, you know, go walk right into ministry. No. The Bible says he grew in favor in man and in God. So he, he went along. He had to learn, um, you know, things around the house. I believe he had chores. And he, um, Joseph, you know, taught him that family trade because he was a carpenter. And so he didn't just rush into ministry. He lived, right? He learned, right? And so we know that even though he was God in the flesh, he still went through a process. And so that's what we have to do. So poor in spirit. Isaiah shows us exactly uh, individual poor in spirit. Okay, so the next beatitude, we're going to move on to um, Matthews, the fifth chapter, the fourth verse read. Blessed and enviable, happy with a happiness produced 
by the experience of God's favor and especially conditioned by the revelation his matchless, of his matchless grace are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And so here, this particular beatitude is talking about those who mourn, right? And so in times of mourning, we can be comforted, right? We have the comforter, the Holy Ghost, right? God puts his spirit in us, and through the spirit, he comforts us. Let's look at 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, uh, I'm going to start at verse 3, and again, I will read from the Amplified Version, and it says, Who comforts, consoles, and encourages us in every trouble, calamity, affliction, so that we may also be able to comfort, console, and encourage those who are in any kind of trouble or distress with the comfort, the consolation, and encouragement with which we ourselves are comforted, consoled, and encouraged by God. And so comforting um, uh, um, doesn't also, doesn't always pertain to when I'm just mourning, right? Through, you know, a death of a loved one or what have you. Comforting is, is, is in time of pain, right? And so we can be comforted through the Holy Ghost in strength. And, and sometimes we may suffer the loss of a loved one. And in that time, especially if we don't understand, um, you know, it may be difficult to deal with. God can comfort us and give us the strength, right, to make it through these those tough times. Um, comforting through the Holy through the Holy Spirit, um, encouragement. You know, there were times when I um, had to learn. As David says, I learned to encourage myself in the Lord. I was always quick to pick up the phone anytime, you know, I had something going on, first sign of trouble. I want to call somebody so they can encourage me. But I learned to put on my music. I learned to just find the scripture, you know, and, and I learned to encourage myself. And some days I would, like, I would have a prayer list, right? And I have tons of prayer lists. And what I would do is I would make a prayer list. And put scriptures according to the prayer list, right? If I'm believing God for something, I have a scripture to go with it. And so for 21 days, I put the start date and the end date. And each morning I would pray over that prayer list. And so when God would do it, I would check it off. And so how I learned to encourage myself in the Lord, whenever I'm faced with something, I say to myself, okay, guess what, Nick? God did it back then, he'll do it again. He got you through the last time. And so you have to understand the same God that got you through that, he'll get you through this. And I can look at the prayer list and see things that I was asking God for and he delivered. And so encouraging means, you know, we can encourage ourselves and cause others. Um, comfort, God can also give us um, the hope to deal with hardships. And there's been times in my life where I was faced with things. And some things you literally cannot see your way out. I've been there. Dark. Very, very dark. But I always, right, put my hope in God. Because I understood if I can't see my way, I know God has a way. And so some days it might not have always been that way. But I learned to know that my hope is in Christ. And so we are comforted. In times of hardship, you know, God will give, they always say, if God uh, bring you to it, he'll get you through it. And so that is a fact. You know, God comforts us in our um, hardship. And so the next beatitude um, is Matthew 5, verse 5. Bless, happy, joyous, spiritually prosperous, with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor, and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions, are the meek, the mild, patient, long-suffering, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, so the word meek is defined as mildness, gentleness of the spirit, or humility, right? Sometimes people will say, they have such a sweet spirit about them, you know, um, a person can like really have patience, you know, and, and, and a lot of people, I look back 
that helped me and you know in my times of learning and growing in the Lord they took time out with me and so they were always available and whenever I had a question you know so people they didn't they wasn't short on patience especially if they knew I was dealing with something and you know I really was struggling they no matter what you gonna get through this they pray so people can be um, very very meek they can have patience in dealing with you and some people you can just tell they have such a sweet spirit but let's look at um, James the first chapter in the 21st verse and again I am going to read from the amplified version James 1 21 says so get rid of all uncleanness and and rampant outgrowth of wickedness and in a humble, gentle, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your heart contains the power to save your souls. And so here we see James is advising us to get rid of all that is wrong. And so, like I just said, sometimes I would go to certain people and you know, I would say, you know what, I got so mad and, you know, and I cussed out my husband or I, I cussed out my kids, you know, because that was the first thing that I found very, very difficult, you know. And so cursing, whoa, that was something that I had to deal with. And I so wanted um, to, to, to be rid of that. And I'll never forget it. I woke up one day and I said to myself. Girl, when you get mad, whoa, you get mad. And then every time you get mad, you, you start cussing, you know, because in my anger, I couldn't put my hands on you, but I would try to, you know. And so I said to myself, I'm just going to practice saying nothing. And so in my anger, I would sit in silence. And some, sometimes my, you know, my ex-husband would say to me, you okay? I mean, say something. You ain't saying They got used to me fussing so that when I stopped, they was like, all right, well, what's going on? But, you know, I learned to just let that anger, you know, it was just a feeling, right? And once I cooled down, then I was able with a level head and in the right spirit, um, you know, express myself. And so I could remember calling um you know, um, pe the people of God and saying, you know, I just cursed out so-and-so. You know, nobody ever said, again? Why you keep cursing? They never made me feel, and I, I know I got on my nerves, you know, after a while, but the meek, right? The meek, the people that are meek, they have patience, they work with me, and so therefore, we can be, um, James advises us to get rid of all that is wrong in our lives and be humbly glad for salvation we receive. That's what the scripture talks about um, in the King James Version, it says the engrafted word, because it alone saves us and so we have you know is we're sinners by you know right we're sinners saved by grace it's by faith through grace right they sing that song by faith through grace i'm able to receive all that i need sister lane that was her favorite song and so we have this assurance let's go on to the next beatitude so we matthew 5 Verse 6 says, Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, upright and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. And so this we see. It talks about thirst and hunger. And so it, this particular scripture deals with um, righteousness, right? And it, 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 the King, this um, Amplified Version says uprightness and right standing with God. So it has to do with a relationship with God. Um, Rochester on Sunday, the radio station, once the um, gospel broadcast goes off, I'll never forget it, the um, radio personnel, personality would say, it's better to have Jesus and not need him than to need him and not have him. And that is so true. And so we know that in a relationship, the closer we get is by more time 
we spin with each other. I remember some years ago, a gentleman on my job, he had um, married his girlfriend. And I mean, I don't know how long they had dated, but shortly after the marriage, I don't know what went wrong. She ended up leaving him. And so when she left him, he went downhill and, you know, he had stopped coming to work and, you know, he wasn't, you know, they wasn't, the other employees had to actually send somebody because he was he had stopped calling out and just people knew what he was going through. So they was like, let's go out here and check on him because we haven't heard from him. There was a time he was calling in, but then no one heard from him. And so when he did finally make it back to work, um, he was one, I was working for an electric company and he was the meter reader guy. And so when he came in, um, he came over to me and I had never really had too much conversation with him, but again, they knew that I was a Christian. And so he came over to me and he said, you know, Nikki, um, I've never prayed in my life, you know, and he said, I don't know how that works for you. He says, cause I just been praying and begging God to send her back. And he just, he's, he, he's not doing it, you know, I don't think he's, he said, I know he exists, but I don't think he's hearing me. And so it's, it takes a relationship, you know, um, we have to understand that in having a relationship with God, right, it's nothing that is forced. Um, the old fans, right, if you look at the, ch the fans in the church with Jesus knocking on the door, the outside of that door does not have a doorknob because Jesus said the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. He wants you to let him in. And so nobody wants to be in a relationship with somebody and they, you know, and they force it. You know what I'm saying? You want them to want to be. I want those. I want you. You want me, right? You know, so it's not a forced situation. And so we can look at it on a nat in a natural sense where you are what you eat. That's what they tell us, right? And so, therefore, it works the same way, just like in the natural and the spiritual, right? Um, I heard a preacher say, I don't know, I thought it was funny, but she said, um, Sunday morning, we know what you did all week, because it shows up in the music, right? She said, it shows up in your two-step, you know, so you can pretty much tell what you were feeding, because Sunday morning, it brings it out, so... You are what you eat. So if I'm reading my word and I'm praying, you know, and doing all the things to cultivate this relationship with God, the more I seek him, the more he's going to fill me. And so Jesus challenges his his listeners here um, to look at their spiritual appetite. Right. My hunger determines my spiritual health. I only can get out whatever I put in, right? I can't go to the bank and take out a thousand dollars if I didn't put a thousand dollars in there. And so this deals with the the our spiritual health. And so you can't just be going to church every Sunday, right? And then in between, you know, Monday through Saturday, you're doing your own thing. I would never be in a relationship with somebody who just showed up you know, out of routine and, you know, wasn't putting no time in and wasn't in, in, in seeing my co-worker um, situation. He said he had never prayed. Never did it. He believed that there's God, but he never prayed. And so we can't treat God as, you know, now I have an emergency. I need you. It doesn't work like that. You know, there's level to this, you know, and so I put in. I, I read my word. I'm not saying I'm trying to beat anybody and I'm trying to be better than anybody. I know what works for me. And so you can only get out what you put in. Let's move on to the next beatitude. Verse 7 reads, Blessed, happy to be envied, and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward condition, are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Now we all need God's mercy. And the mercy of God is basically God withholding a just punishment from me, right? So in my sinful nature, when God looked down and seen this the state in which I was in, him being God and being just, he he should have given me. I thank God he didn't what I deserve, which was, you know, the Bible say the wages of sin is death, but instead he gives me mercy. 
Right? So that's what mercy is. Mercy is God withholding a just punishment. He doesn't give me what I deserve. And so I, in turn, I show mercy to others. Right? I forgive, you know, no matter what the situation is because God has forgiven me. Right? I have compassion, you know, on certain situations. Why? Because God it has compassion on me. And so I don't look at um, others' faults and flaws. And I can remember having a conversation with someone and, you know, they was really, really being hard on their spouse. You know, oh, you don't know he did this and he did that. And, and they were just really, really ragging. And so I just simply said to her, I said, listen, we're all guilty of something, right? I said, but I know what it is I'm guilty of. So it does me no good to point a finger at somebody else when I myself know that I'm struggling with something. That's not mercy, right? And so when I see someone struggling with something, with something, I'm always prayerful. Lord, bless them, you know. Lord, help them, you know. Holy Ghost, arrest that mind, you know, because we all have things that we're struggling with. And so I may not be, I'm, I would, it's not about perfection, but I can say I'm a lot further, that I'm a lot closer to God than I've ever been in my life. And the only way that I can do that is, is, is letting go of the old me. And so some things I have to come away from. Because we see when Isaiah was called, he, he, see, he seen himself for who what he was, a, a sinner, you know, sinful nature. You know, so the closer I get to God, God, the more aware I am of my imperfections. And so I don't point fingers at people because God gives us all mercy. My son, I think he was 17 years old. He made a mistake, right? He broke into somebody's car, stole their gun. He really, now he's not a street kid, you know, but he really had no need for the gun. So he passed it on to someone else. This someone else got caught with it. And my son just being, you know, not the street person that he is, the person said, well, I got it from him. And so he was charged according to what this person said. And so, again, not knowing, my son goes in there and say, yeah, you know, I broke into the, I broke into the car, you know, and I stole the gun. So he was charged. And so my ex-husband, I can remember at the time saying like, yo, man, it's a gun charge. It's serious. And I said to him, listen, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't know what to do, but I don't want to hear, you know, because he kept saying, oh, we're going to do. And so and sometimes people can dump that on you again, not to um, ignore rea the reality of it. I'll just look to God. And so I can remember coming home um, on a Thursday night and when I got up that Friday morning, which is normally my fast day, I said, I have to fast for my son. And so for the next three days, I didn't eat at all. I could feel the weight by Sunday afternoon. But I was saying, Lord, please give him mercy because justice will send him away for a long time. And so I never forget it. My son might have been locked up for two weeks. And when I went to visit him, he was sitting on the visit crying. He said, Mama, you don't know. They telling me that, you know, I don't get the youthful offender and I'm going away. I said, son, hear me and hear me well. I have fast. I know God heard me. I asked him to give you mercy. I said, now you may be guilty, but he's going to do this for me. And he couldn't wrap his mind around it. But I knew that I knew that I knew God was going to let him out. And I said, God, allow him to know that it is all you. Court day came, my husband went, when he caught, was called up, the judge said no bail, no release, sent him back. When my son called me, he said, Ma, the inmates, was, we was all getting loaded onto the elevator. He said the DA, the DA came back and said, Adrian Ravenel, and my son said, here I go. He said, come on, son. And when he pulled them aside, they went into the judge chambers and he told him, listen, I believe this is an isolated incident. I don't want this to be on this young man's record, right? Because it'll affect him when he goes to college. 
My son called me. He said, God, let me out of jail. Because let's understand this. The DA's job is to lock you up. And so the DA asked God, I mean, asked the judge, and God allowed the judge to give her mercy. Because understand this, I acknowledge the judge. I do. I'm not going to sit here and make it seem like the judge is irrelevant. But in my eyes, he's but a vessel. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. He does what he wants when it comes. You understand? So just because he's the highest power in the courtroom, I know somebody higher than him. And so mercy is when God gives us what we don't deserve. Instead of justice, he gave my son mercy. And that is a testimony. I think about it and I always thank God to this day. And the next Beatitude, we're going to go on, says, Bless, happy, and be fortune, fortunate, and blessed, and spiritually prosperous, possessing the happiness produced by the experience of God's favor, and especially conditioned by the revelation of His grace, regardless of His outward condition, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so, pure we, is defined clean, blameless, right? Unstained guilt. The heart can mean um, the physical heart, and the heart can also mean the spiritual center of one's life, right? So that would be my thoughts, my desires, my sense of purpose, will, uh, my understanding, my character. Pure in heart means blameless in who we actually are. Only in Christ can I be pure in heart. And so again, it's a lifestyle, right? Doesn't mean that I'm not going to mess up. I mess up. But when I'm pure in heart, right? When I have a pure heart, I'm striving to get that thing right. I'm not trying to still, you know, I want to stop cursing. And so, therefore, I'm reaching out to people and, you know, and I'm asking God to help me with this. I need help. You know, I still cuss after I got the Holy Ghost. But he was doing his work because, lo and behold, I have control over that today and so therefore i thank and i praise god for being pure in heart now let's see with king david we're going to turn over to the 51st division of psalms and we know that this is the psalm um david had written once nathan the prophet had came to him regarding his sins with Bathsheba. and david says in psalms 51 the 10th chapter and i'm reading from the amplified version Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit, preserving and steadfast spirit within me. Only God can give me the right spirit, right? It's his Holy Ghost that desires his will, right? The Bible talks about let this mind that was in Christ also be in you. And so my thoughts, everything has to be lined up with the word of God and so we thank him and praise the God praise God for the um pure in heart next we're going to look at the peacemaker uh chap uh, Matthews 5 9 says bless envy um bless enjoying an enviable happiness spiritual prosperity with life joy and satisfaction in God's favor salvation Regardless of the outward condition are makers and maintainers of peace for they shall be called the son of God. And so this one we know the peacemaker, right? So let's look at Jesus first. Jesus laid his life down to make peace between God and the sinners, right? And we are to carry on that same message to others making peace, right? Making being that makes us the peacemakers because we're to do, you know, Jesus gave us the great commission, go out into all the world, right? And and preach the gospel. And so we're doing what he did because he made peace between us. Me as the intercessor, when I intercede for people, I stand in between someone and God and I go to God on their behalf. And oftentimes when I have the intercessory prayer, I say, Lord, I stand proxy for this person. And so that's how. We are to be how Jesus was. God delights in those who reconciles other, reconciles other to himself. Those who are bringing reconciliation to broken relationships are carrying on the work of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. 
those who give of themselves as Christ did in order that others may know God are called blessed. And so here again, it has nothing to do with stuff, right? It's talking about doing what Jesus did. The Bible said he who wins souls is wise, right? I win souls for the kingdom. And so therefore I am blessed, right? Because I let people know about the God that healed me, the God that saved me, the God that delivered me. And I let them know he did it for me. He can do it for you. And so that's what we, we bring peace to a relationship because people always um come back and say, you know what? I really thank you. And, and I don't, not saying that I don't like for people to, to do that, but I always tell them, thank God because he used me, right? It's not a, on my own, it's not of my own strength. I'm not doing it on my own. It's God. He used me. I'm a willing vessel. And so now we're going to go to the last beatitude. And it says, Blessed, blessed and happy and enviable, fortunate and spiritually prosperous in the state in which the born again child of God enjoys fine Enjoys and finds satisfaction in God's favor, salvation, regardless of his outward condition. Are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for being and doing right, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed and happy to be envied, verse 11, and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward condition. Are you when people revile you and persecute persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely on my account? And so here he's talking about persecution, right? So persecution is defined to pursue with harassing. This arise from the other seven because the forces that oppose God's ways still hold power in the world. Persecution comes from unrighteous behavior wait persecution from unrighteous behavior is not blessed right so if i find myself in a bad situation because i did something wrong that's not blessed but persecution for doing the right thing yes that is blessed because that's what this this particular um beatitude tells us now let's look at first peter our last scripture and this went a little long because of the beatitude. So the, the context was a little long. And so 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, the first verse. And once again, I will be reading from the Amplified Virgin. And it says, So since Christ suffered in the flesh for us, for you, arms yourself with the same thought and purpose, patiently to suffer, suffer rather than fail to please God. For who's, whoever has suffered in the flesh, having the mind of Christ, is done with intentional sin, has stopped pleasing himself and the world, and please God, so that he can no longer spend the rest of his natural life living by his human appetites and desire, but he lives for what God has will. And so here we see Peter tell us that suffering helps us be Christ-like. We will try to avoid, we, we, we do, we try to avoid suffering, as followers of Christ, we must be willing to suffer. Suffering shows with shows what I am really made of. And so when times, right, when my back is against the wall and I'm going through something, you know, I, I had to learn that what I show in my going through made a difference. Because Pastor Rick used to always tell me, God is not concerned about what you experience. It's your reaction to what you're experiencing. And so, of course, we don't, you know, we don't want to go through. Nobody wants to go through. We would avoid, right, any type of adversity or persecution. But anyone who suffers for doing good and still faithfully obeys in spite of suffering has made a clean break from sin. My daughter watched me go through one of the most difficult times in my life. And I can remember having a conversation with her. And she said to me, you know, so-and-so was saying, oh, I got a new truck. And I'm blessed. She said, but you know what I noticed, mama? 
She said, you are really blessed. I said, why you say that? She said, mama, you went from a house. You had a car. You had everything, a job, your husband. She said, you was good. She said, and now I watch you staying at Uncle Mikey, sleeping on somebody's couch. You're not working. You don't have your own place. You don't have a job. You barely have money. She said, but you still serve God. She said, anybody else would have given up a long time ago. But I have a relationship with God, right? And so all through the Beatitudes, we see the same, we see the same words, right? Saying, happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions. She said, Mama, you blessed. You showed me what, really bl what blessed really means. She said, because when you lost everything, she said, you still stayed with God. She said, so nobody could ever tell me because they got a truck, they're blessed. She said, I really looked at your situation. And so it's not predicated. And so we went, is, let me finish my thought. It's not predicated on stuff. And so we went through the Beatitudes given by Jesus of what blessed really is. He didn't mention anything about a fat bank account. He didn't mention anything about Chanel bags and, you know, $800 shoes. And it's no disrespect to the people who work hard. So I'm not here. I don't want to sound like a hater because I'm not, right? Everything that I've I've had and I've lost it, but today with little I have, I feel more closer to God than I've ever been. And so stuff is is good to have things. It's good to, you know, you know, you you work hard, you make stuff, you know, you make money, you get whatever it is you want, whatever makes you happy. But for me, my relationship with God, and so I'm spiritually rich. That that I do have, Apostle um, Peter and John, when they was walking by the beggar and he was had his hand out, Peter say, silver and gold, have I none? Right? But that that I do have to offer you, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. So I'm not here to knock the individuals that are working hard and living that life that they wanted to live, taking trips and Power to you. I'm just here to show what blessed according to Jesus. Jesus gives these beatitudes. He gives them. And so I'm just trying to help folk in their understanding of blessed. Because we know now people say they blessed because the check is here and the, the car or, 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 you know, they got a, a job or, you know, I bought me a house and God is so good and he blessed me. And these folks ain't living according to the beatitudes. The conduct, right? Standards for believers, followers of Christ. And so in order for me to be blessed, I have to find, look in this, this, this code of, the code of conduct, right? Every job, they have you go through the code of conduct, how you're supposed to conduct yourself, carry yourself, what you can and cannot do, right? While you're on the clock, right? The code of conduct for believers, not stuff. And so... I, I tried to get away from this message yesterday and read out of the starting, right? Your day right with Joyce. And I couldn't even do the message because God had already gave this same message to me. So I, I know what it is God is saying. And so I'm just trying to convey to people out there. We can still, we're still chance to get it right. Still opportunity to get it right. Don't mean it's over. But at least try to get it right. He's the living God. So he's just not the God of certain people. No, he's the living God. And God is long-suffering. Meaning he's, he's given me the opportunity. He's given me the time to get that thing right. Because he lives, I can live according to the Beatitudes. Because he lives, 
I can be blessed. He lived that I might be blessed. Jesus, right? Jesus came and died. He became poor so that in him I might become rich. Has nothing to do with stuff. Has nothing to do with stuff. Blessings add value to your life. And they said, well, some debt is good and some debt is bad. I don't know. Right? I don't know. A mortgage is good debt and credit cards is bad debt. I don't know. Again, I don't know. Right? I have neither. Thank God. But that that I do have, uh, I thank and I praise God for he lives. He's the, he's the living God. We serve a risen Savior. Why search for the living among the dead? Huh? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because he lives, we can live according to God's standards. Until next time, be blessed, stay blessed.